The last part of our conversation about convolutional layers is the pooling layer. So pooling is actually a very, very simple operation and it's probably easier just to look at what's going on. So let's look at an image. Okay, it's a, admittedly a very primitive image. It's a five by four pixel image, which consists of ones on the two left columns and zeros throughout the rest. If I now apply an edge detector, I'm going to find an edge at column number two. So if I then were to shift that image by one pixel to the left or to the right, well, that edge would shift by one pixel. Well, that doesn't sound like a lot, but if I want to have maybe later on features that are somewhat translation invariant, then I clearly can't have it if my features all depend exactly on where they occur. So we need to have some mechanism for giving us invariance with regard to translations, lighting, object position, scales, appearance, and so on. And this is exactly where pooling comes in handy. So let's look at 2D max pooling. So max pooling does the following thing. It takes an input. For instance, here it's a 2x2 two two patch. And it just takes the maximum of that patch. Then it moves one block to the right. It performs that again. And it does that. And so if we do 2x2 two two max pooling, we turn a 3x3 three three input into a 2x2 two two output. So the semantics in terms of the size work exactly like what we saw before by convolutions, except that rather than multiplying and adding terms, we just take the maximum. Or if I have a 4x4 four four image and I perform max pooling over a 3x3 three three window, then I'll get a 2x2 two two output, which is exactly what we're seeing on the right. So what you can see is in the previous example, so let's say we have a vertical edge detector, we perform convolution, and so now the 2x2 two two max pooling becomes tolerant relative to a one pixel shift. And that's exactly what we wanted. Now, if you want to make sure that by pooling, the output doesn't really change or maybe changes in a well-defined way, then you can use padding and stride in exactly the same way as what you would have done before. So first of all, in terms of input and output channels, they are the same because you perform pooling per channel. And in terms of stride, well, it's just a matter of how many pixels you shift before you apply that window again. There are no learnable parameters. But for instance, if I want to preserve exactly the same size of the image, then I could, for instance, take a three by three max pooling and pad by one pixel on either side and I'd get the same output. So there we go. If I do this, so here's a three by three pooling. And as a matter of fact, here's, I get a smaller image out of it because, well, I'm using a stride of two. So this padding of one stride of two, which will reduce the image resolution. Now, besides max pooling, there's also average pooling. In average pooling, what you do is you simply average over the entries in that window. So this is a very common operation that everybody knows. For instance, if I take a very high resolution image with my camera and I want to reduce the resolution, I might just down raise that image. Now what the photo processing software does is actually performs average pooling where it averages over a larger number of pixels to get that. This is what was commonly used in the 90s in the early convolutional networks, but switching from average pooling to max pooling improves accuracy, which is why by now everybody uses average pool, max pooling. There's one exception Namely, at the very last layer, when you perform global average pooling, you actually add them together. We'll talk about that in a lot more detail in the next lectures.